Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, India. 15 of the most polluted cities in the world are on the subcontinent. We take a look at the health costs to one of the world's fastest growing economies. Also already under pressure from a trade war, now the anti-government protests could plunge Hong Kong's economy into recession. I'm Rick Clark reporting from the Lofoten Islands in Arctic Norway on an area rich in biodiversity, but also in the crosshairs of the big oil companies. Hello everybody, uh, this week's a little different on Counting the Cost. We've let our correspondents and documentary makers loose on a number of important economic stories, big picture stuff, and given them a bit more time to do so. And we are starting with what has become the world's most polluted capital city. And according to the World Health Organization and Greenpeace, that city is New Delhi. In fact, 15 of the 20 most polluted cities in the world are in India alone. Clearly it can't be good for people's health, but how does it impact the country and its economy? Al Jazeera documentary maker Neha Tarameta has this feature report. Like many parents in Delhi, Dr. Shailendra Bhadoria knows that allowing his children to play outdoors comes at a cost. Air pollution is affecting our life on a day-to-day basis. Once I moved to this place, I started developing asthma. And next few years, it became really worse. Sometimes I have to come in the middle of the night to the ICU. Even my daughter, who was just one month old, she also used to get asthma attacks. Dr. Bhadoria lives in one of the most polluted parts of the city and believes the air quality is made worse by emissions from a waste-to-energy plant in his neighborhood. There is high level of pollution in Delhi, and on top of that, this plant. So definitely, even in Delhi, if you are staying one place or other place, there is a difference. As a doctor, he knows only too well that air pollution can have lasting consequences on his family's health. With the time, you might have a weak lung, weak exercise capacity, I cannot continue my exercise capacity exercise for a very long period because after a few days I get either cough, cold, asthma, anything. The plant management refused to respond to our query on its health impact, but one of its top officials said in a WhatsApp message that the plant's performance met all operating parameters and is well within prescribed limits. Over a million Indians died in 2017 because of air pollution according to the Global Burden of Disease study. But the Indian government has consistently maintained there is no direct correlation between air pollution and deaths. There are multiple causes of mortality. How do you pinpoint that air quality is the cause? It can be a trigger. It certainly is a trigger in most of the cases. But uh, I think if you continue to do studies on this, and come up with conclusive data, it helps. But an increasing number of doctors say there is a clear link between air pollution and deaths. There is enough data available that air pollution kills. Science must continue, but action should not await the results of scientific studies because that may take 10, 20 years and by that time we would have lost millions of people unnecessarily to this menace. Air pollution has been linked to a third of all lung cancer deaths in India. One of its victims was Priyanka Jain, a digital marketing consultant based in Delhi. She was diagnosed almost overnight with stage 4 lung cancer. The right lung is completely damaged and uh, um, the cancer has spread so much that it's just not visible on the x-ray. When we met her in April this year, she blamed the city's dirty air for her illness. I don't foresee any other reason for lung cancer to happen to me otherwise. Breathing is the most important practice that you're doing every moment and that's your source of life. So the air that you're breathing, if that is poor, that definitely is a significant contributor for any respiratory disease. Her doctor also believed that air pollution could have led to her terminal illness. There's enough evidence in the world that pollution can do that. And I really wonder if that was the main contributory factor in her case. Priyanka lost her battle to cancer in July 2019 
less than four months after we'd interviewed her. She had just turned 27. And it's not just the health of people that's being affected by air pollution. It also affects the health of the economy. If you add up the number of years we are losing because of illness, because of the productive time, and you know, all these are coming at huge economic cost. India is one of the world's fastest growing economies. And even though its growth has slowed down, it aims to be worth $5 trillion over the next few years. But according to the World Bank, the country lost over 8% of its GDP in 2013 because of air pollution. And latest research from the Indian Statistical Institute shows that reducing pollution would help the country gain billions. If we could cut air pollution to zero, every Indian would be willing to pay about $300 per year to cut that risk. The total benefit would be about three or four hundred billion dollars per year, which is about 10 to 15 percent of total income in India. Please help us. We are not able to breathe. Air pollution has dominated the headlines in the country for a few years now, even moving major political parties to include it in their manifestos. The government is making a push for clean energy and electric vehicles, among other measures. Earlier this year, it launched the first national clean air program that aims to bring down air pollution in more than 100 cities over the next five years. But some experts think the program needs more teeth. Any target without clear compliance and accountability mechanism does not work. So the current approach that will collaborate, cooperate, find friendly answers, that is not really going to bring the kind of, you know, that push that we require to make things happen on ground. And with studies indicating that nearly 700 million Indians are exposed to polluted air, there's little time to lose. If we were to freeze all the legislation and do nothing now onwards, in 2050, roughly 930 million people or half the population in 2050 would still be exposed to air which exceeds our ambient air quality standards. Prathna Bora of Clean Air Asia says there are lessons to be learned from how India's neighbor China has battled its notoriously high air pollution levels. China puts air pollution not as part of an environmental agenda, it's part of the national planning process. So obviously it's an economic agenda. In countries like ours, where, where we are looking at uh, rapid development, we're looking at you know, energy transition, we're looking at things like smart cities, we definitely need to integrate air within, within development policy. Industrial pollution remains a serious challenge, but businesses are beginning to step up, says Seema Arora of the Confederation of Indian Industry. While industry realizes that we do cause a bit of this problem, a lot of them are coming up and saying, how can I be a part of the solution? And this change we are only seeing in the last one year, actually. The government is betting big on moving to cleaner vehicle emission standards in 2020. But this hasn't come without challenges for the auto industry, which is already struggling with some of the worst sales figures in recent years. The time given to us was extremely small. In three years' time, we are supposed to defrog. And internationally, Countries have taken anything between 8 to 10 years to do this kind of work. Meanwhile, citizens are opting for private solutions to a public problem. This chemist tells us that his sales of breathing apparatus have been booming. Masks and nebulizers are going to become compulsory in the time to come. Every home will need to stock up on them. And this building in a busy South Delhi neighborhood aims to offer pollution-free office space. PM 2.5, a highly dangerous particle that is 30 times smaller than the width of human hair, is almost absent from here. So we are right outside one of Delhi's greenest buildings, and the PM 2.5 levels here have been hovering at about 100, which is about twice of India's daily national standard and about four times that of the international standard. Let's go and see what the building is doing now to clean up its air. Entrepreneur Barun Agarwal shows us the plants and technology that keep pollutants out. 
The mechanical filtration takes care of the particulate matter and some of the harmful outdoor gases that when you bring outdoor air, there are outdoor gases as well, that takes care of it. Whereas the plants help in reducing the indoor pollutants, i.e. the volatile organic compounds. And the PM 2.5 levels have actually come down to 14 from about 100 outside. That's the difference that the air purification process makes over here. Arun also has a warehouse stocked with air purifiers that cost between $400 to $2,000. A hefty price tag for most Indians. Is it elitist? Yes, it is. But if I can afford it, if I can help my kids and my family breathe better air and help them protect their lungs, I'm going to do everything I can. And as for Dr. Bhadoria, the line between his hospital and home has blurred because of his daughter Nandini's frequent asthma attacks. And unless the city's pollution is brought under control soon, Dr. Bhadoria may just join the growing ranks of highly skilled professionals leaving the city, not for greener pastures, but for cleaner air. Al Jazeera's Neha Tarameta with that insight, and you can see more of her work and that of our documentary makers online. Head to aljazeera.com slash people and power or have a look in the documentaries menu. And now to Hong Kong. You've seen the protests there. You've seen the depth of feeling. But the territory's finance chief has now warned the economy could be plunged into recession if the anti-government protests continue. One citywide strike cost the economy as much as $332 million, according to economists. And don't forget the knock-on effect, too, from the trade war between the United States and China. Andrew Thomas has been reporting for Al Jazeera right throughout the protest movement. Here is his take on the economic effect. Monsoons during Hong Kong's rainy season often put a dampener on shopping. But this year, it's not just the rain. Protests against Hong Kong's government are having a big impact on the retail sector. Retail revenues in June were down 7% year on year. Figures for July and August are expected to show drops of between 10 and 20 percent. This locksmith in central Hong Kong says in 42 years it's never been so bad. Business is terrible, terrible. People have lost the desire to spend. I hope both sides can resolve the conflict soon so to stop hurting the economy and free us from worry and fear. Tourists, too, are missing, especially those from mainland China. Hotel occupancy rates in June, as the protest began, were 3% down on normal. July's figures, once they're out, will show much steeper falls still. These are those who weren't put off this time around, but for some, it was a close call. Mainlanders like us are afraid to run into protest. I won't be rushing back. I'd rather wait until it all quietens down. It worried me when I heard about the demonstrations before I came. Since I've been here, it's actually been fine, peaceful. There's been no sign of demonstrations in the places I've been. Tourists losing confidence in Hong Kong is one thing. But if international credit rating agencies do too, that could be disastrous. If uh, the protests continue and escalate uh, and become uncontrollable, then that will have a significant impact on Hong Kong's okay, uh, credit rating. And uh, that will be uh, a huge okay, negative impact. Hong Kong's current credit rating scores are similar to those of the United States. They're a lot better than mainland China's because Hong Kong is seen as economically and legally independent. The protests could mean a downgrade, either because they make Hong Kong a more difficult place to do business, or because evidence of Beijing asserting its authority would undermine the independence that many consider makes Hong Kong special. The cost of doing business will be higher, and that will have impact on their uh, profits. Already, Hong Kong's economy was sluggish, weighed down by the US-China trade war. 
April to June figures show annual growth of just 0.6%, well down on a year ago. And then there is housing. Prices dropped almost 1% in June, with much bigger falls expected. Property is an immovable asset, and it can't escape from the impact of the political instability. Uh, so uh, not many people are willing to enter the market in this kind of situation. Property sale volumes in July were at their lowest level of the year. Many analysts expect property prices here to fall 10% by the end of the year, although those working in property say 2014's Occupy movement was expected to hit prices too, but it didn't end up putting off investors from the mainland. The impact of these protests could be similarly small. 2019's protests, though, have already been the most widespread Hong Kong has ever seen. The city is known for economic stability and success, but its success depends on its stability. And finally, some in-depth environmental reporting, because if you want to count the cost, then the cost to our planet is arguably the most important one. Now, for decades, Norway has been smart. It's saved money from the sale of its oil and gas and in doing so created, actually, the world's biggest sovereign wealth fund, today worth a trillion dollars. But now, recognising the damage done to our climate from the use of hydrocarbons, the fund has started to sell its holdings in oil and gas and is actually leaving oil, worth billions of dollars, under the ground. Our environment editor at Al Jazeera is, of course, Nick Clark. Here he is with a multi-layered report looking at how climate change is shaping the landscape of Norway's shipping, fishing and oil industries. The far north of Norway is spectacular, a land of mountains and fjords and raw beauty. It's an important fishing area and, as you can imagine, it brings in the tourist dollar. This is actually the highest mountain in Lofoten. Particularly in the Lofoten Islands, where getting up close to nature is what you do. Oh yeah, there she goes. The problem is the wealth here also lies beneath the waters. For a long time, the Lofoten Islands have been in the crosshairs of the big oil companies because their geologists know that in these coastal waters lies an untapped oil field worth an estimated $60 billion and their bosses want a license to explore. In the past, this has been supported by the government and for many, it's a big concern. I would not say I'm all against oil, but I'm also really afraid of the damages that can happen if there is a big oil spill, so I, I wouldn't take the risk. But things may be changing. Recently, Norway's opposition Labour Party withdrew its support for Lofoten exploration, meaning now there's a majority in Parliament to keep the islands off limits. The young people today, uh, they are more important about uh, the future, uh, climate change, uh, what should we live, live, live about. Um, and I think the fisheries and the tourism industry uh, is the future more uh, than oil and gas, especially in these, uh, these uh, Arctic areas. Norway is a nation made rich by four decades of oil and gas extraction, with the sovereign wealth fund worth a colossal $1 trillion. So any move away from fossil fuels is significant. The climate crisis is also more real. It's uh, close up in our face. We have to do serious stuff the next 10 years. Uh, and educated people in Norway understand that. Even we start to understand that uh, there will be some changes and it's not even maybe politically decided but the market will change, the demand of consumers will demand and uh, we are happy with that we are making progress. But for those in Lofoten who rely on these waters and fear the potential impact of oil spills, there's still scepticism. We never get the fully, uh, fully no for oil exploitation. So for me it seems like it's only no until it's yes and when it's yes there's no turning back. At a time when the world needs to radically cut back on fossil fuel emissions, it will become increasingly hard for the nation to justify new extraction contracts, especially in these waters. This is what made Norway rich long before oil. Arctic cod or scray in their millions fill drying racks across the Lofoten Islands. Winter after winter, fishermen here have cashed in on the annual migration south from the Barents Sea. It is a tradition that goes back thousands of years. The cod is caught, it's gutted, and then it's hung out to dry for several months. 
And what you end up with is a dried fish that retains nearly 100% of its nutrition, a prized delicacy from Italy to Nigeria. This is what supplied the Vikings on their long voyages to far off lands and still now is a big part of the Norwegian economy worth millions of dollars. The fish comes from the Barents Sea and it goes to Lofoten to spawn. And that because of the Atlantic Stream. So the Atlantic Stream, it stops by Lofoten and brings food, it brings the higher temperature, even though it's not warm, but it's higher, yeah. <laughs> high enough to, to spawn. And it's a very um, delicate uh, ecosystem in Lofoten. That fragility is spelt out by a ream of scientific research as a changing climate and warmer ocean temperatures upset the balance of the marine ecosystem, meaning the scray may be forced out and then it's a question of where they go. Obviously if keep things keep warming, some of those true polar species might end up not having a whole lot of places to go if they're being outcompeted by sort of these more southern species moving north that would you can see, um, you might see some considerable changes there. This year, Geert Nielsen caught 13,000 kilos of cod. It's been a pretty good season, but he's worried about the future. Climate change could change everything. The, the cod can suddenly stop coming to Lofoten because it'd be warmer and going longer and longer north. So then we, we have a, a big problem. Every year as spring comes, the cod leave. Their return has always been a certainty and a necessity, not just for the fishermen, but for the seals, seabirds and whales that feed on them. Now this extraordinary feat of nature is under threat, and the outcome as ever depends on the political will to act in a time of global crisis. The Kleven Yards on the west coast of Norway, where there's been a long, rich history of shipbuilding. But this is something different. Two ships, the Roald Amundsen and the Fritzhof Nansen, are nearing completion, and they're a step into the future. Both these vessels are state-of-the-art expedition ships that will take paying passengers to remote parts of the world, powered partly by battery. Putting a new expedition ship together is a complex process, as you might imagine, involving welders, carpenters and plumbers. And, of course, electricians. There's more than 750 kilometres of cabling, to say nothing of detailed and extensive wiring for powering the ship by self-generated electricity. The batteries aren't in place yet, so what, what are we, what's going to be put in place here and what will we see? And this rack here can, uh, can fit 20 battery cells. Uh, it will be about 1,000 volt for each cell or each rack here. With these racks which we have behind us now, we can reduce the 20% of the fuel consumption of the ship. The vessel's thrust will come from a combination of diesel and battery power. The batteries themselves will be constantly charged by the ship's engines as they run. Kai Albrightson will be captain on the Roald Amundsen as she attempts the Northwest Passage later this year. Uh, it's really important because we, we are uh, going to, to remote areas, vulnerable areas, and uh, to be able to do, do no free footprints, but the footprints that we will give is only the green footprints. We supply the power system with the batteries as we are sailing, but also when we do the operation in Arctic, Arctic and Antarctica. Given the shipping industry is responsible for a significant proportion of the global climate problem, change cannot come soon enough. Ultimately, the dream is of a ship with no need of a funnel. Hybrid and, and uh, reducing uh, consumption is one thing, but uh, even more interesting, I think, is uh, the work that is now going into uh, fully electric uh, um, shipping. Uh, we've uh, seen some initiatives on that as well in Norway, and uh, that's an area where uh, Norwegian, the Norwegian shipping uh, industry might get an advantage as an early adopter. Electric ferries can already be seen in some of the world's ports, while onshore power in others enables vessels to be plugged in so engines can be switched off while docked. And Herty Gruten are now planning to convert several ships, like the Nordcap here, to run on a combination of fuel, including biogas, made from organic waste like timber and dead fish. But the day when the mega ships of the world are powered solely by renewable energy, well, that is still in the distant future. And that is our show for this week, but we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet or message me directly. I'm at Kamal AJE. Do use the hashtag 
at AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email, counting the cost at aljazeera.net. Uh, is the address and you can visit us online as well aljazeera.com slash ctc that'll take you straight to our page with individual reports links and entire episodes for you to catch up on but that is it for this edition of counting the cost i'm kamal santa maria from the whole team thanks for joining us the news on al jazeera is next <laughs>